Uh, the class will proceed by uh, first figuring out uh, a core set of principles for how the brain works. Um, this is diagrammed here on the left. Uh, we call these uh, collection of mechanisms Libra, which represents a kind of balance scale idea that there's uh, essentially uh, lots of different uh, ways of thinking about how the brain works. And we're trying to seek some reasonable, balanced, intermediate perspective that takes into account lots of different uh, key constraints and kind of puts them all together in an in a integrated perspective that we think captures all the key elements that you really need to understand all of the core elements of cognition. Not everything in the brain is in this model, but we think it's capturing the core pieces that we really need. And those core pieces, again, start out with understanding individual neurons, how, how individual neurons fire. We look at very detailed understanding of uh, ions and how electrical forces and diffusion forces, which by the way is a completely emergent phenomenon. Um, it's not a fundamental force in the sense that electricity and magnetism are, but it nevertheless works just like those forces. And it just is a result of diffusion uh, little ions bubbling around in a liquid and that produces a force. So right there, even at the most fundamental levels of how neurons operate, we have this core emergent property at work. And that helps us understand uh, overall how these electrical uh, charges move around in ions and that is the fundamental basis for how neurons work. So again, neurons really are actually like uh, our computers in the sense that they are electrical systems. They can be described with electrical principles and we can understand these. These have been well established since the 40s um, and we can have actually current models of, of individual neurons in the cortex are very detailed and very accurate in capturing how neurons fire. So this is actually a very well understood area and we build on that foundation to try to use that knowledge and try to again introduce those biological constraints so that we don't have to be making up stuff. We can actually use what, what's already known. So that's the core of it, is how does each individual neuron operate? What is each individual neuron doing? What computationally is the function that each individual neuron is, is performing? And there we have this concept of detection. Neurons are detecting things in the environment. They're looking for patterns. Um, then we move up a level and think about how do those neurons work together when they communicate in networks. And this is the level of interactions between neurons in uh, larger sheets. Uh, the cortex, the word cortex actually means sheet. Um, and this outer part of the cortex that we're looking at over here in this picture of the neocortex, the outer area of the, of the human brain, um, is uh, a sheet light structure and it has a very uh, stereotyped very common structure across all the different areas in the brain and yet also each individual area of the brain does have certain special kind of configurations or modifications it's got its own special properties and so understanding kind of the commonality what's common across all the brain areas and what's special is key for understanding how the overall brain works and this set of core mechanisms helps us kind of give us a foundation for understanding that so we know that individual neurons in these different brain areas compete with each other. That's a critical principle. They inhibit, uh, they interact through local inhibitory interneurons that produce this inhibitory dynamic. And that struggle, that competition is just like in evolution, a really critical principle for organizing these networks and getting individual neurons to do something different from each other. And that's essential for getting the brain to self-organize and create these knowledge representations, if we just had all the neurons able to kind of do the same thing, then we would have like no differentiation, no uh, different thoughts. We would just have like one stuck thought in our brain. Um, so inhibition, inhibition, specialization, these principles are really important and we can understand that biologically and computationally how those, uh, comp those biological properties of inhibition produce this emergent competitive dynamic that shapes the nature of knowledge as it develops in the brain. In addition, the brain also has bidirectional excitatory connections. So each area sends excitatory projections, so individual neurons kind of exciting the neurons in other areas, but also receives that feedback from those other areas uh, that helps reinforce uh, 
the messages that are being sent. And it's very much like in social networks. Neurons are incredibly social little beings. They love to talk to other neurons and they love to receive those messages back from other neurons just like people do. And uh, just like, you know, on Facebook, if you like somebody's post and then you want them to like your posts back, it's exactly the same kind of principle. So neurons love that kind of mutual reinforcement, mutual and positive interactions. And we think that that is a really important principle that allows, for example, higher level ideas that we might have in our brain to percolate back down and, for example, create the possibility for mental imagery. We can imagine what something looks like just by activating some concept. So I'm picturing a shiny red car. I can picture that. And just by thinking of that idea and kind of allowing those high level concepts to fill in, I can picture my son's uh, Lego uh, Cadillac. Yes, I'm filling in all those details just by uh, thinking about these concepts. And so that uh, ability to go back and forth, up and down, and have information kind of fill in throughout our brains, we think is really important for understanding how human cognition is as flexible and as powerful as it is. So those are two really important principles that, he, that we think about in chapter three, uh, looking at networks of interacting neurons. And again, these are really key places where interactions between neurons working together produce something that's greater than the individual neuron emerging comp complex cognitive abilities come out of those interactions between these individual neurons um, it's really critical that there are many many layers of these neurons so they're organized into these sheets and there's many many layers these are called deep networks and that's you may have heard of uh, a very important principle in modern ai uh, techniques that are based on in, very much on these same kind of principles of how neurons work together. Although I'll note that uh, most of the current uh, AI models do not capture this kind of bi-directional excitation, and that may be a critical element that, that's missing in those models that is present in the brain. And then lastly, uh, we really focus in chapter four on how do these synapses between neurons adapt over these experiences and shape knowledge. That's where knowledge comes from, from this process of tuning individual synaptic connections among neurons, uh, shaping the way that each neuron kind of detects and fires and responds to different incoming signals. That is the process of learning fundamentally in the brain. We can understand that again mathematically. Uh, we can write equations as you see here and simulate those equations on our computer and th in so doing capture a lot about how the brain actually learns. And if you look at this, these are actually the set of equations that we use, um, even though we think the brain, again, is a vastly complex, huge, uh, amazing organ, we're looking at a very simple, very small set of equations that we can use, again, simulating across many different brain areas, each with different parameters and different patterns of connectivity but using these same core set of equations to capture how neurons interact and how knowledge emerges from these systems. So it's really kind of amazing.